Okay, good Friday morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm one of the hosts of the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist Series, and I'm excited to be back with you for a lecture called The 17-Year Itch uh, with a look at cicadas, and in particular, the 17-year cicada. Uh, I loved researching this episode because I found out there was so much, there was so much I didn't know about cicadas, um, and I did have my stereotypes of cicadas, and I'm and uh, I, I'm sure you all do kind of have the that that memory, the the association. If you think of cicadas, there's probably a few things that you you probably think of. Um, and I'm really excited to share the stories that I learned with you. Uh, before we get started, the Backyard Naturalist is brought to you by the UEC in my backyard, which is brought to you this month by McGillis Weimer Attorneys at Law. I finally get to do commercial, personal injury, family law, estate planning, and more expert litigation attorneys in Milwaukee. Let them protect you. And in all seriousness, I'll mention that Graham Weimer is a, is a very good friend and someone I trust. Um, and I can vouch for the integrity that he brings to his work. And I thank them for sponsoring uh, the Backyard Naturalist this month. And always a huge thank you, as always, a huge thank you to all of the subscribers out there for the Backyard Naturalist for keeping this weekly space for learning, uh, going strong into the future, hopefully. And if you enjoy this time together, please consider signing up for a subscription if you haven't already. Uh, new to the UEC in my backyard, backyard is a blog from Aaron Whitney on how to turn an invasive species into deliciousness as she shares a recipe for turning garlic mustard into a yummy pesto. There's also a new Chad the Nature Dad on tree fungi and I was hoping to show that video, but uh, I've been having some issues embedding videos into the program. Uh, so today we're gonna save the videos till the end and maybe I'll wait a week um, while our co-host and IT guru can maybe help me figure out the situation. So thanks in advance, James. Uh, I would also like to put out a, a very quick plug for membership at the Urban Ecology Center because becoming a member is one of the best ways to support the center. And if you do sign up for membership, tell them the Backyard Naturalist series sent you. And this month, our friends at Triciclo Peru, which is just six blocks from my house over here by Washington Park, is offering a 10% discount off dine-in or takeout orders to UEC members. Uh, just ask for the UEC discount when ordering. And if you haven't had their empanadas, you're missing out. This is one of the first restaurants I started ordering from uh, soon after stay at home last March, and I've never been disappointed. Um, and because it's just a couple blocks from Washington Park, you can take the advice of membership manager Glenna Holstein and bring your takeout over to Washington Park for a picnic. So that is win, win, win. And this is also where I often remind you about the Urban Ecology Podcast, which I will do again, uh, because I really enjoy listening to the new episodes that come out every other week. But this week, I'm going to give another shout out to the Encyclopedia Podcast, hosted by our good friend and former coordinator of the Urban Ecology podcast, Danny Pirtle, because for Animals in April, uh, Danny interviewed me and we talked about uh, this former backyard naturalist star, the American Crow. So now posterity has us on page 57 of Danny's amazing show. I strongly encourage you to subscribe to and listen to uh, both the Urban Ecology and Encyclopedia podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. And this was also pretty cool. The show right before mine on page 56, also part of Animals in April, was about the cicada killer wasp. So I won't uh, give you the spoilers for that. I'll encourage you to listen to that show uh, for full details. Or you can just Google cicada killer wasp. You probably have an idea of what it does. Um, and then finally, thanks to everyone who participated in the Bruce City Burning Festival last week, speakers, participants. Our, our preliminary numbers for the Backyard Birding Blitz came in. And we had 34 checklists with exactly 200 species of birds from four countries and six U.S. states. We, uh, team names included Counting Crows, the Northern Alula, Take, Take, Take It Easy, Phoebe's Followers, and Sandhill Cranium. Some of the highlighted birds included a Montezuma Oropendola from Costa Rica, a White Wagtail from the Czech Republic, a Gira Cuckoo from Bolivia, a Nande Parakeet from Florida, a Swainson's thrush from Minnesota, a Baltimore Oriole from Ohio, an Orchard Oriole from Wisconsin, Oop, that's a Michigan mute swan, uh, and a Greater Roadrunner from uh, Douglas in New Mexico. Okay, 
So now we turn to the star of the show, the 17-year cicada. And since there are actually three species of 17-year cicadas, and only three, uh, I will focus on one of the two Wisconsin natives, the pharaoh cicada. And it's named the pharaoh cicada, and we'll listen to this in some of the videos, and one of the videos at the end, because of its call, it kind of goes pharaoh, pharaoh. Uh, it's sometimes called the 17-year locust. Um, and while I acknowledge that most of my sources of information for this come from Western so sources, uh, cicadas here in Wisconsin were, were very well known to the woodland Indian nations that have lived here for many thousands of years. And I would like to respectfully acknowledge uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation, the Menominee, Bands of the Lake Superior Chippewa, the Forest County Potawatomi, the Oneida, Mohican Indians, um, and others who are the past, present, and future stewards of this land. We have featured several insects in past episodes. So if you'd like a refresher on what makes an insect an insect and the various orders of insects, uh, check out season one, episode 10, A Spittlebug's Life. And like the spittlebug, which grows into the adult frog hopper pictured here, which is the champion jumper in all of the animal world, uh, much more, much better than a flea. I guess better is, I should say, higher. Um, cicadas are eukaryotic arthropod animals belonging to the order Hemiptera. Hemiptera means half wing, due to the fact that the forewings in many Hemiptera in, hem, in many Hemiptera uh, only harden halfway, which give that a, a give them kind of a characteristic look. And Hemiptera include many of what we call the true bugs, including bag bug bed bugs and stink bugs, uh, which have to be two future backyard naturalist stars, as well as aphids, leaf hoppers, and tree hoppers, and this frog hopper. And they all have piercing, sucking mouth parts. Um, cicadas belong to the aptly named family Cicada Day. The word cicada is thought to be onomatopoeic. Uh, in that some cicadas are thought to say their names, much like the chickadee or the phoebe. Um, in some parts of the U.S., they're called tree crickets, even though it's decidedly not a cricket. In fact, cicadas are one of the most mistakenly named insects. Maybe in our history, uh, they've, they've been called in the historical records flies and locusts and crickets, um, but maybe it's because they're noticed by a lot of people and uh, they're kind of in your face every every. 13 or 17 years. So uh, they're not related to any of those flies, locusts, or crickets. Uh, if you live in Appalachia, you may know them as jar flies. But whatever you call them, there are over 3,200 species of cicada worldwide. Cicadas have two sets of wings, usually a larger pair of that membranous kind of tougher forewings and a pair of smaller hind wings. And their wings are, are very well known for having excellent antimicrobial properties and water repellent properties, which is, probably has to do with so, with so much of their life is subterranean that um, maybe those properties kind of are, are, are in their bodies. Um, in fact, human engineers are studying them very closely for those properties and for human applications in biomimicry, uh, particularly in fighting bacteria that are dangerous to humans. As adults, cicadas are visual species with widely separated compound eyes, which give them excellent peripheral vision that are paired with those simple ocelli on top, which alert them to predators like birds that would attack from on top, from up, up in the air. One of the things that cicadas are fairly well known for are their songs, but they don't have vocal cords and they don't make songs via stridulation with their legs like crickets do, but they do make exceptionally loud sounds through structures on their abdomen that are called uh, timbrels, which are membranes located on the sides of the abdomens uh, of male cicadas only. And the sound is produced when uh, contracting and retracting muscles bend and unbend the timbrels, which by the way is the same, that bending and unbending process is also what makes your blinker in your car uh, 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 it's kind of what it's designed for, even though it's an electrical circuit, it's kind of designed with that bend, unbend, on, off, on, off, uh, even though it, it isn't actually that anymore, usually. Um, 
I don't think anyway, it, it used to be. Um, and so that those contracting and retracting muscles produce a sound that by itself is pretty unassuming, but they contract and relax those muscles 400 times per second. Uh, and just as importantly, the rest of the male cicada's abdomen is hollow. Uh, so it's not hollow like, like a, a, bird, a bird bone has, has hollow uh, cavities to make the bone light. But the reason that the cicada abdomen is hollow is because it wants to take that little noise that it makes and resonate it. Uh, it's the same reason that guitars have hollow bodies or when you make that homemade musical instrument out of rubber bands, you use that Kleenex box with a hollow space inside. So those empty spaces resonate the sound. And if you combine all of that, the, the very rapid uh, clicks and the resonating chamber, the call of an individual cicada is loud enough on its own um, to produce up to 90 decibels in some species. Uh, so that tiny insect, one of them can get as loud as your lawnmower. Now put thousands or some, in some cases, tens of thousands of cicadas together and that sound can be truly deafening. Uh, cicada researchers liken going home after a night of field research with cicadas to going home after listening to a, a live rock concert, the, the, the ringing in the ears because that noise is deafening. Uh, in fact, one particular group of cicadas was recorded at 126 decibels, which incidentally is about the same volume as the loudest bird, which we learned about the Bruce City Birding Festival, the white bellbird. Uh, both the bellbird and the cicadas produce sounds that are equivalent to the siren on an ambulance. Um, and if you're like me, I always need to plug my ears when an ambulance goes by on the street. So, so we have another record holder here uh, with the loudest insect in the world. And uh, when I thought of cicadas, uh, before doing this research, my mind immediately went to, my association went to that 17 year variety um, that emerges in huge numbers and leaves, leaves behind the skins, the exuvia, uh, in our parks, in our backyards, but so uncommonly, right? Every 17 years or every 13 years. Um, but there are two major groupings of cicadas. And the biggest one is the annual cicadas. And they're called annual cicadas because they show up every year. So it doesn't mean that like an annual plant, that its life cycle is annual. Some of them are, uh, but some of the annual cicadas uh, can have two, three, four, five, 10 or more years in its life cycle, but some of them at least emerge every year, not the entire population emerging at the same time. So that's why they're called annual cicadas. Um, and they are worldwide. And so if, if let's say we have five year cicadas somewhere, uh, that year, the, the fifth year individuals, the individuals that are five years old, they'll emerge, but down in the soil, you'll still find individuals that are four years old that are gonna wait till next year and individuals that are three-year-old that are gonna wait for two years. So there's always uh, a class coming up or a cohort coming up. Um, they're sometimes known as the dog day cicadas uh, because they tend to emerge later in the summer, uh, especially July and August. And they tend to be very well camouflaged. Uh, so they note, note the dark color on this one, the kind of dark, the dark, especially in the eyes and the green, um, this one's a little more conspicuous for the, for the camera, but if you put this in a tree, uh, annual cicadas can be almost impossible to spot, even when they're right in front of you and you know you can hear them, they're loud, you know they're there somewhere, but uh, they can be very, very difficult to spot. So they use camouflage um, as an anti-predator mechanism. Annual cicadas tend to be larger. Uh, the largest cicada in the world is an annual cicada with a six inch wingspan, which is enormous for an instinct for an insect. Um, but this distinction of calling a group of cicadas annual only needs to be made in North America because throughout the rest of the world and the other five continents, not in Antarctica, um, all cicadas are annual and emerge every year. So you don't have to call them annual cicadas, you just call them cicadas. But in North America, um, and only in North America, in fact, only in Eastern North America, there are a group of cicadas that are called periodical cicadas. They're all in the genus with a great name, magic, magic I want to say magic cicada, magic cicada. 
uh, they are magic um, cicadas, and there are only two groups of the periodical, periodical cicadas. There are 17-year cicadas and 13-year cicadas, and that's it. There's no such thing as a two-year or a 10-year. Um, if you are a cicada in the eastern part of North America, therefore, you are either annual or 13-year or 17-year. Um, there are only seven species of periodical cicadas, three species of 17-year and four species of 13-year. They tend to be smaller and they're much less camouflaged. They're much more in your face. They've got these bright red eyes, um, these bright colors. Uh, they don't even appear to, to even try to camouflage. Um, and other than some very rare cases, you can set your calendar uh, by their emergence. In fact, historians have and continue to use accounts of periodical cicadas in the past to help uh, to help figure out the historical records um, and stories and, and to verify certain dates. So for example, Governor William Bradford of the Plymouth Colony recounted the appearance of periodical cicadas in 1633. And he says, in the month of May, there had been a quantity of a great sort of fly as large as wasps or bumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground, filling all the woods and eating the verdure. They made such a constant yelling noise that the woods rang with them till they were ready to deafen the hearers. So way back in 1633, we already knew they were coming out of holes in the ground. It was a rare thing. They were super loud um, and he called them flies. And in his own account, he said that this event happened in 1633. He wrote it several years after 1633 but he credited the events to happening in 1633. But historic, historians can literally track back the, this particular brood of cicadas in Massachusetts uh, in 17 year intervals back uh, and, and verified by historical accounts along the way to be fairly certain that he got the date wrong, that the events in this narrative actually probably took place a year later in 1634. Uh, so remember that for your next trivia night. Um, and he was probably mistaken in recalling the year. And that's how precise 17-year cicadas have been. It's like Swiss clockwork. Uh, in fact, um, cicada biologists often have a history background and they're often looking at this historic written account to study both the biology of cicadas and to study humans uh, in that kind of archival process. So it seems like a really fun uh, insect to study. Um, you, you've yeah. Tim, oh, someone asked if you could repeat his name. I sure can. I'll, I'll repeat the name and bring the face back. It is Governor William Bradford of the Plymouth Colony. And that's about all I know. Um, so you, you've probably heard in the news lately, um, it, on, on podcasts, on websites, in newspapers, and, and television, um, that 2021 is the year of the brood X cicadas, which sounds really science fiction-y and important because it has X in it. But brood X is actually brood 10, the X being the Roman numeral 10, uh, which then had me wondering, uh, first of all, have, it, ha have I been calling one of my favorite shows the wrong thing all these years? Um, but secondly, if there is a brood 10, then does that mean there is a brood 1, a 2, and so on? And how high does it go? And the answer can be found right here. Uh, this is one of the active tracking maps of broods of cicadas. Um, this is all of the known extant or still around today broods of uh, 13 and 17 year cicadas and uh, in the entire world, right? Because they're only found here. They're, so this says their location and I will, I will send you the link to this and, and several other links because there's, there are some websites you're gonna wanna look at. Um, uh, there's there's so much interesting information on this. Again, both from a, a biological and kind of a pop cultural uh, standpoint. Uh, Bob Dylan wrote one of his songs about cicadas that emerged the night of his concert, and you know uh, he apparently went home right after that concert and wrote the song about the chorus of cicadas that joined him that night. Um, so you can see that, and if you were to look at this map, you can see that Brew Ten is emerging this year. Uh, in several states in the Midwest, dipping into the South uh, and spreading to the East. 
And in Milwaukee, uh, we'll look at this again, but Brood 13 will emerge in 2014. Um, so only three short years before it's our turn in the spotlight. Um, and so this is all based on the emergence of broods of cicadas. And so to better understand this, uh, we, we should take a quick look at the life cycle of the periodical cicada for a better understanding of what's happening. And again, a lot of this is similar to the annual cicadas um, and the, the, the 13 years and 17 years, but we'll, we'll take a closer look at these periodical uh, cicadas. So if we, if we start by going back, way back in time to a few weeks ago, uh, early April of this year, and let's pretend we're now in the heart of Brood 10 territory in Ohio, uh, in early April, we would have started seeing this, these in our yards, in our green spaces. Um, and this is when the pest control places get a lot of calls about moles in their backyard. Um, but uh, they're not moles. And these are cicada nymph tunnels. They're cicadas that have been in the ground for, uh, in this case, 17 years. And they're ready to finally emerge above ground and to abandon their subterranean existence forever. Uh, they will build these tunnels up to the surface uh, just before they're ready to emerge. And uh, sometimes the tunnels will be open, sometimes they won't be open yet. Uh, if there's wet soil or if there's a lot of rain, they will build up and turn the tunnels into what, what are called turrets. Uh, because especially if they're open and they're not ready to emerge yet, the cicada nymphs don't want their tunnels to fill up with rain just yet. So this is kind of like putting up sandbags around our houses to keep uh, the flood water out of our homes. Um, and these turrets, you can find them easily. They tend to tend to be found under uh, like near decks or areas if, the, if there's rain dripping off your house. Um, again, some, some wetter areas, you'll see the turrets. Um, and the, in this case, the insects themselves are probably about four to six inches below the surface. Um, and this is one of their first kind of post subterranean vulnerable times because now they're, they're ready, they're getting ready to emerge, they're not quite ready. And this is when some animals, raccoons, dogs uh, will start to dig them up uh, because they can probably smell them. Um, once the soil temperature not the air temperature, but the soil temperature. Once it reaches exactly 64 degrees, uh, the cicada nymphs emerge like zombies from beneath the soil. They're endothermic. Uh, and so at 64 degrees, apparently their body is warm enough to finish out their lives and do the things they need to do above ground. Uh, this is based on local soil temperature. So some areas might heat up faster than others. So you might get within a particular brood, uh, some areas, the they'll emerge a few days earlier, uh, even maybe front yard to backyard, depending on shade, you might get some variation. And that variation is really important uh, because of all the predation that we're gonna talk about. Um, so yeah, if they all emerge exactly the same time everywhere, that might be a problem, um, but this kind of allows them that variation that they need. Um, and, and they do emerge, like I said, within a few days of each other, um, maybe up to a week. And they emerge in massive numbers. So studies have found cicadas uh, emerging to the, the tune of a density of 350 in a square yard. So in my house, a, a square yard is about the, the size of that space between my front door and the inner door that takes one step to cross. And you'd have 350 down below your feet. Uh, if that were in, you know, in some of these denser uh, broods. So in one acre, which is less, slightly less than the size of a football field. So you take the, take away the end zones in about 10 yards. So you've got 90 yards of a football field. They can have a one and a half million cicadas. And in a square mile, in certain cases, they've estimated a billion individual cicadas in a square mile. So that's three times the population of the United States in one square mile. And that, that again is the extreme, but you can see just how dense uh, they can get. And um, yeah, again, it's, it's not always that dense, but when they do emerge, uh, you can see why it's so incredibly exciting to have so many uh, 
individuals and why you can see in the past this has been related to biblical events or spiritual events or or things like that like what the heck is going on i've been here for 16 years this hasn't happened and now uh all of a sudden there's just an inundation one of the reasons they're called locusts too is because of the uh it's similar to some of the locust swarms uh that you get in the old world the first thing that the emerging nymph does when it leaves the soil is that it finds something to climb and usually that's a tree, but it can be anything that's vertical, a building or a pole. If you were to stand still long enough, it could be you. And then once it's up to a good height, and, and they probably only know what a good height is, the emerging nymph um, will lock its legs on whatever it climbed, and it will go through this final transformation. It will shed the last stage of the nymph exoskeleton uh so after they grab on then pretty much right in the back the the uh the exoskeleton splits right down the middle like like if you were to have a tight pair of pants or a shirt that might rip right at the seam right down the middle it crawls out of the old skin and the old skin is still hanging on to that tree thankfully uh so the adult it's now an adult and it's holding on tight to that exuvia is what it's called the exoskeleton once once the adult leaves and uh and then the exuvia is holding onto the tree it takes a while this stage can be a uh, uh things can go wrong and unfortunately uh if, if things go wrong enough the adult can die without successfully making this final moat which i don't know you can maybe imagine how awful that must be spending 17 years of your life for this one day and then uh things go terribly wrong at this point but they're much more likely to be eaten by this point or or during or after so it's not it's not that embarrassing um and so as soon as they leave their old skin uh again called the exuvia they that that that's that old skin stays there and it it represents the ghost of that past nymph so they went from zombies emerging from the soil to ghosts and i've i've actually found a lot of cicadia exuvia um i'll bet you have two they're really cool they're just like this exact replica like a fossil frozen in time. Um, but once they emerge, uh, the new adult becomes what's called a teneral adult. Now, it's important to know that if you wanna eat cicadas, and there are a lot of cookbooks and websites and a lot of things out there that, that can help you learn how to eat cicadas, this is the best stage to eat them uh, because their exoskeleton, their new exoskeleton wings are still really soft and palatable. Um, and it's going to spend the next 90 minutes making itself less palatable by pumping out the wings and hardening the exoskeleton. So if you wait too long, it'll become more and more difficult to eat. Um, Dr. Kritsky on the Ologies podcast with Allie Ward likes it, likens it to eating uh, the shrimp part of a shrimp, but then waiting too long and having to eat that tail part, that really hard tail part. Once the exoskeleton hardens, it also starts to darken. And that pale, palish kind of teneral which is on the left here turns into that beautifully colored adult cicada on the right um and that's where that's what most of us will see and uh so again they are very conspicuous throughout this process and during these first few hours many 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 cicadas will get eaten um by animals other than us so in interestingly the very first cicadas to emerge uh tend to be skewed towards the male so the 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 first uh, group to come out from the ground tends to be concentrated um, heavily towards the males and they're also the ones that are most predated because uh, they're the first to emerge and the predators are like oh look at all these insects coming up so a lot of males kind of sacrifice themselves uh, and then later once all the predators are stuffed and can't eat anymore a lot of those kind of waiting females now it's like all right I'm going to make my move um, and thank you to the males uh for helping with that um and again these are these are big juicy meals uh to a bird or a raccoon or your pet dog or a cat so so many predators will go nuts early on um and and this strategy has likely to do with just that they're basically saying we're gonna put so many individuals out in the open at one time and we know we're delicious um so go ahead eat what you can but you're not going to eat us all and there's going to be plenty of us left over later that won't get eaten um 
and and cicadas pretty much throughout their lives are pretty defenseless. Uh, you you wouldn't study them for defensive adaptations, uh, except for one of their very loud calls uh, can be given at the right moment if they sense a bird is about to swoop at them or a mammal is about to get them, and it basically surprises that bird or animal or thing is going to eat it with that very loud sound very quickly. And they just, all right, I I'm, I'm getting out of here. But other than that, um, there's not a lot of, uh, things they can do. If you snap your fingers and some of the videos that if, if you look through these rabbit holes, if you snap your fingers, um, they might look at that as a, a threat and they will make their, their sound louder. That's when they get into that hundred decibel range. Um, and uh, so that, uh, but other than that, I mean, they're not camouflaged. They're terrible flyers. Uh, they're, they're terrible jumpers. There's not a lot more that they can do. So a lot of them are eaten. After about three hours, their shell and their wings are mostly hardened, but it does, they, they're, they do need more time to do this. And so they will climb higher in the tree, try to find a safe spot as they can, and they'll finish that hardening process. Uh, which can take anywhere from two to five days. But as soon as that's done, they're ready to mate. And um, male cicadas will gather together in trees in massive numbers, uh, just like birds do in leks. And they'll just start singing their, their, in their glorious way at that ear-spitting volume. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned how loud they are. They're so loud that they have to protect their own ears from their sounds. Uh, so they have a membrane that covers their rudimentary ears. And while they're calling, they close up that membrane so they don't deafen themselves. And the males will call and call and call um, for about five days. Um, and you have that five-day period again because not all uh, individuals are emerging at the same time. If they're unsuccessful at a particular tree or at a particular branch, they'll stumble fly their way to another part of the a branch or to another tree. They can fly. Um, and, and maybe try their luck out in a new uh, location. If a female is interested, and I don't know how they sort through all the mess, but she will flick her wings at him. Uh, this, is, this is aimed at one individual, but there are many males paying attention. And this is when uh, certain males can kind of sneak in to that interest. Um, and, and probably because it's so chaotic, I, I, I think they're, they're fairly successful at this. But she will flick her wings, and then either the calling male or one of the competitors will move closer, change their call, and um, tap her with her forelegs. And then if everything goes according to plan, uh, they make a lot of uh, new cicadas. After, yeah. Yep. Right. There's a question in the chat that um, if the females are able to close their ears as well. I would hope so. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, the 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 the, the um, information I looked at was talking about males at the time, but God, I would hope that um, that females have that, or or maybe they just don't have to worry about. I don't know. That's that's a really good question. I'll try to find that out. Um, after the males sing, their life is over. Their glorious life is over, and they die. Females live a little bit longer because now they have eggs to lay. And this adaptation, as with everything, uh, is pretty insane. So a female cicada will find um, the new growth uh, in the terminal branches of trees and will uh, release her ovipositor from her body. So you remember in some wasps, these ovipositors will actually like drill into solid wood. Uh, her ovipositor has a, a central... Uh, kind of uh, axis and there's two serrated structures on the ends and she moves them in opposite directions like a saw. So she's got these serrated ends of, uh, of her ovipositor and she saws and cuts into the wood. Uh, and if that's not crazy enough, those metal serrated, those serrated parts are made of metal. They're, they're, they're reinforced with metals. So she has metal serrated saws on her body, uh, just like Wolverine, and she saws into the wood to lay her eggs. She'll lay about ten eggs in a row, uh, in a in a you know just a, maybe about a quarter of an inch space, and then she'll move over a uh, quarter to a half inch and lay ten more eggs, kind of repeating that process 
until uh, she either runs out of room, in, in which case she'll start on a new branch, or until she runs out of eggs. And then when she's she runs out of eggs, she she joins the male and uh, also then will die. Uh, not with the male, she just dies like the male did. Uh, each each female will can lay and usually do lay about 500 eggs. So imagine when you see a tree full of cicadas and maybe half of those are, are females or slightly more because most of the males got eaten. Uh, for every female, there, there, there could be potentially 500 more cicadas there in 17 years. Um, and, and again, if you do want to eat them, uh, and, and you didn't harvest them at the tenoral stage, this is an, another good stage to eat as the pregnant females because um, after she made it, she has about 500 nutritious eggs in her. And, and remember the male is hollow. So at least for a, from a calorie standpoint, you'd, you'd be much better to eat the females than the males at this point. And there's a, a question about the ovipositor. Um, what, what kind of metal is it made of? And I don't how know. is it produced? That is an excellent question, um, uh, and I will I will look at that. How produced and what kind? If anybody knows, um, let me know. You know, I, I do know that uh, oftentimes it has to be would would have to be taken from the environment. Maybe if they're underground, maybe that helps. I don't know. I'm I'm only conjecturing here, but uh, that's an excellent question. So after the incredibly cute and adorable nymph, like the one uh, in the circle here, hatches from the eggs, the first thing they do is they will immediately drop to the ground. And at this point, they're extremely vulnerable to predation by spiders and ants and beetles that are going to start noticing these things raining down from above. Um, so as soon as they hit the ground, the first thing they do is they try to find a crack in the soil that's big enough for them to crawl through. And they're tiny, so they don't need too big a crack. And oftentimes that crack is formed by a blade of grass that's coming out of the dirt. So that's really convenient because they can take advantage of that space that the grass is making between itself and the soil. And then it immediately has a food source and they'll start feeding on the grass roots for a while um, before they move on to tree roots. And again, Hemiptera have these piercing sucking mouth parts and they tap into the xylem system of trees and plants. And if you remember, xylem is almost all water. Uh, so there's very little nutrition in the xylem. Um, and we talked about that with the spittle bugs, how, how much they have to eat and, and um, exude to make those little spittle bowl, balls because they have to put a lot of, of that xylem through their system to get any kind of nutrition. nutrition. Uh, and this could be the could be one of the reasons why we're we're talking 17 years for development or 13 years for development because their their food system is very nutrient poor. Um, and then after those exciting first few moments of life to quick get out of the tree and quick get in the ground, the next 17 years they're hanging out below ground. Um, they're probably not going to move more than a yard, a cubic yard from their initial burrowing spot. Uh, and, and, and until they emerge as nymphs 17 years later. Um, so they're hanging out. They hang out below the frost line because they don't want to freeze. That would kill them. Um, and, you know, the, the, the frost line in soil isn't usually that deep. Uh, it gets deeper as you go farther north. So they don't have to go that far underground, um, usually maybe a foot or so, uh, depending on where they are. And just like when you visit a cave, um, you know, uh, even if you go in the winter, you 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 need a long sleeve shirt maybe and a small hat, but you don't need a winter coat to visit a cave because in in that cave the temperatures uh, pretty pretty steady, usually around fifty degrees. And it's the same for the habitat for the cicadas. Um, it's it's not as warm as they need for when they're above ground. And again, this could also be part of why it takes them so long to develop. Uh, they're uh, as cold blooded animals; they they can't move that fast. Um, and but you know, they really don't need to. They can take it slow and steady. Their, their uh, nutrient poor diet, might, they might need that 17 years. Um, and tapping the tree root incidentally has virtually no known effect on the tree's health. The only time that the tree might be in danger is if uh, an adult female lays all those eggs in a, in a young tree. 
then that trauma might be enough uh, to cause a secondary infection. And it, it can be pretty rare, but they, they could kill a tree. But, but again, that's, that's fairly rare. Um, so young trees are about the only thing that these insects can harm. Uh, they, as I mentioned, they don't bite, they don't carry diseases. There's nothing they can really do to harm us. Um, and, and we can eat them. And at this point, um, I guess as bizarre it all is, the, the biggest questions that come to my mind and, and probably yours too, why 17 years and why 13 years? And how do cicadas know that 17 or 13 years have passed? Uh, these are questions that have both intrigued and baffled scientists for years and continue to invoke their wonder today. For the first question, why the numbers 13 and 17? Uh, the answer is we don't really know why specifically those numbers. Does it matter that they're prime numbers? Could it have been 20, 12 years and 20 years and worked just as well? Um, the leading theory still has to do with, with several of those layers. We talked about the pressures of predation. So if they're mostly defenseless and these young, yummy animals emerge, uh, maybe because it was so long since the last time that the predators don't have a way of figuring out their pattern and kind of relying on them as a food source like they can do for the annual cicadas, which is one of the reasons the annual cicadas are more camouflaged. Um, so it could be that anti-predator. Uh, we do know that the seven species of periodical cicadas evolved in North America um, about 300,000 years ago during intense glaciation. And it could be that that area below ground was the most hospitable habitat for them uh, rather than being up up above and exposed to those, those climate extremes. Um, so that could have something to do with it. Spending most of your life underground might be a really good strategy. Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, or, or like I said, it could be because they're nutrient, the, the food source is so nutrient poor um, and they just need a long time to grow. But all of these pressures likely affected their evolution to some degree. Uh, and I doubt we'll, we'll ever be able to definitively figure out why those numbers went out um, and, and maybe that's not the most important question to ask, but it's fun. Uh, as to how they know that 17 years is up, um, that might be a question we can figure out uh, a little fairly well, or at least figure out the mechanism that, that triggers their emergence, that alarm clock that triggers them uh, from, from leaving the soil. For a long time, it was thought that cicadas measured the passing of years through the annual swings in temperature because they are attuned to the temperature. But in many parts of their range, the freezing and thawing cycles can and do take place multiple times in, in, in a year and it still doesn't throw them off. Um, the prevailing theory is that cicadas pay attention to the trees from which they're feeding. And if there's anything we've learned from all the wonderful tree and plant speakers from land stewardship and others, it, it's that trees are way more complex than we imagined. And so it totally makes sense to me that trees and cicadas are sharing information. Uh, the thought is that the cicadas are able to sense the cycles of either leaves or flowers or both. Um, so as the leaves or flowers grow and develop and then senesce or fall off the tree, the cicada is able to like make that check. That's check one, check two, up to 17. Um, uh, Dr. Gene Kritzke, I mentioned earlier, he noticed that trees in his area he, he found a very rare case of, of a, a local group getting thrown off. And what happened that year, that particular year, is that it was a very warm winter. And after a, a hard freeze, uh, there was a really warm spell in January. And the trees actually started, some trees started to, to put their leaves out. Then there was a deep frost. The leaves fell off. And I didn't even know they could do this. But apparently the, the trees put a second group of leaves out. So now that cicada noticed, oh, that was two cycles of the tree leaves and that particular group of cicadas emerged one year earlier than the rest. So that's strong evidence that, that it's really the trees that are kind of providing the information to the cicadas. Um, if enough cicadas are fooled or tricked or, or whatever the, the word is to go off course and emerge at a different time, um, they're probably going to be done for because the year that they emerge, if there aren't enough of them, the predators are just going to eat them up. If enough of them do that, though, um, they could go survive that first year and then make a lot more and survive that second year. And that's probably how these new broods are started. All, you know, we have these 
17 different broods at, uh, that are different years. And that's likely how a new brood is born. Um, so let's take a quick look at all these broods uh, as we kind of wrap things up here, starting with uh, brood one. Brood one consists of all three species of 17 year cicadas. So some broods have three species, some have two, some have one. Uh, and then of course they're 17 year broods and 13 year broods. They can't be in the same because they'd be off right away. Um, and this is in Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee. They will make their next appearance in 2029. Brood two is spread over a larger geographic area stretching up the Eastern seaboard from Georgia up to New York and Connecticut with another separate population uh, that's still on the same schedule as the others. And they'll make their next appearance in 2030 which believe it or not is only nine years from now. Um, but they had their last party in 2013. And the other thing to mention is that each emergence, uh, at least lately is becoming kind of more of this media uh, spectacle. And so um, just like brood 10 is this year, just Google brood 10 cicadas and or brood X cicadas. And there are hundreds of articles from national and local, local media outlets. Brood three is closer to home in the Midwest, uh, but won't make the, their next appearance until 2031. And I won't go through all 15 broods these way, or, uh, but I will point out that um, there are some gaps in the numbers. For instance, brood 11, which was found in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, um, was first discovered in 1835, but was last seen in 1954. Uh, and when they didn't show up in 1971 or 1988 or anytime after that, they were considered to have gone extinct. So broods themselves can disappear and go extinct, uh, just like species. Um, and the concern for cicada broods dates back all the way to the 1890s when people were paying attention to them and they were concerned that deforestation might wipe out uh, the cicadas or the locusts, which is what they likely called them at the time. Uh, today, we're probably most worried. Uh, oh, this was this was the, uh, the last known uh, occurrences in 1954 of um, brood three. Today, we're probably most worried about brood seven uh, as their numbers appear to be dwindling as populations become more fragmented, fragmented. Smaller groups are less likely to withstand that predation onslaught, as I mentioned, and kind of go below a critical mass, uh, which might doom them. There's even a lot of concern over brood 10, which is making that appearance this year because of the fragmentation over their range. So scientists are tapping into community scientists. There are free apps that you can download onto your phone. Um, and it probably not doesn't make a sense for us to do that now because we don't have anything happening. But if you live in the historic range of an emerging brood, uh, you are helping out by reporting if the cicadas emerge in your area. Another crazy thing is that researchers actually tried this system back in 1902. Uh, but because there were no apps on the non phones that people weren't carrying with them, they actually mailed out 15,000 letters to people in the area in hopes that they would respond to that survey and tell them whether they had seen cicadas in their area, the good old US Postal Service. So that's a, a really cool effort more than 100 years ago. And then as I mentioned before, Brood 13 uh, is set to uh, make an appearance in three years. So get ready. And actually, you know, this is showing the whole state. Brood 13 is actually only on the southern part of Wisconsin, unfortunately. So uh, before I wrap up, I do, do want to mention a very bizarre story that Mitch Oss shared with me, with me about um, a fungus that's affecting brood 10 right now. Um, and, and it's almost too strange for even an X-Files episode. There's, there's a fungus called Massospora, which infects uh, the cicadas and it's with them during their whole subterranean time. And then when they emerge and they go through that last molt, it causes the cicadas to lose their abdomen and the genitals. But then it appears to have control of their mind and it puts the cicada into this hypersexual mode and it just tries to mate with every animal around it. Uh, and you, you've probably heard of some zombie funguses before that, that inhabit other insects and cause them to do things. Um, but this is just crazy, that kind of mind control aspect that the, the fungus taps into that uh, insect system and causes it to do things. Um, and how does this help the fungus? Well, the, the, the body parts that the insect loses gets replaced by a white plug of the fungus spores. And then as uh, the, the animal is going around trying to mate with everything else, the fungus spores are, in, are it's, it's a sexually transmitted disease and they're moving into new individuals. It will get into the eggs. And then when those eggs and they, they, they hatch out of those eggs, 
they'll carry the fungus with them for the next cycle. So it's kind of like a perfect bee movies. You have zombies and, and lots of promiscuity between insects. So um, that is the end of today's episode. I, you know, I do, it does amaze me that uh, you have this insect that is here for just a couple of weeks that, that we could see. You can see them when they're in the tiny hatching stage. Uh, and sometimes they'll kind of rain down on you because they're all like whee, falling out of a tree. And some people have that, that pay attention have noticed that. Uh, but then they're right in the ground. And so if you don't see them that first couple of weeks, unless you're digging, you're not going to see them again until they're just in your face, just like, here I am. Um, and, and so I don't know, like, I, I'm judging it from a, a person who lives above the ground. And maybe there's something in the subterranean world that is just awesome that they're like, why would you guys live above ground? Uh, do you know how awesome it is down here? <laughs> so that's, um, that's, that's kind of my, my take on it. I will share. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and, and then, which I've already done. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I'm just going to show you two short videos Good. of there are many, many more. Um, and I apologize. I'm going a little over here. Uh, and I have to share my screen to do this. And well, that's not what I want. Um, here, this is what I want. Okay, so this is uh, just a very short one minute video on how loud cicadas can get. Um, let me know if you can't hear this, James, but we'll try it. Oops. So these are three kinds of calls. So that like pharaoh call, sorry, that was really loud um, in my ear. The, that pharaoh call is, uh, is, is the one that I, I think of most, that pharaoh, pharaoh, you get all of them doing it at the same time. Um, and then I'm just going to share one more short video, short but amazing, which is... Those white strands are breathing tubes. And this next phase is called the sit up phase.
go the extra mile so every rental is. So there you have it. Thanks for joining me.